What are we doing currently to house our veterans? What are some things that we can uh, collaborate, maybe work with each other on so that we can do better? And what resources already exist? Because many of the resources that are out there in the community, there isn't one organization that knows them all. People have organizations that are on their resource list that they go to when there's a veteran that's in need. But really, some of those different resources, if you guys have them, um, share them with the other veteran communities, then we will be able to assist our veterans in a, in a, a much more consistent manner. Right now, we get an average of about five to eight phone calls every month from veterans um, seeking assistance with homelessness or homelessness prevention. And we're not just getting calls from women veterans. While we are a women veteran organization, male veterans are, I have to say, they're the go-getters of the community because they will contact me, call me, not just for themselves. They'll call me for their spouses. So they are a, a lot more proactive than women veterans right now. What we're trying to do is get women veterans to become, um, to one, raise their voice and become their own best advocate, uh, not just to rely on organizations to advocate for them. So what are we, what are we doing to, to get our women veterans um, you know, into the position where they can use their voice, ask the hard questions, and when they get a no, you know, like everyone who's ever worked in sales know that your job doesn't begin until you've gotten a no. So just hearing no shouldn't break your shouldn't break their spirit and prevent them from moving forward. We got to teach them what to do when they get the notes. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to get started here in a second. I'm just going to hit up with Iris. So Iris is our 2018 volunteer of the year. I hadn't put the video out there yet, but last year, um, throughout all the events that we hosted, 12 different <laughs> monthly events that we hosted, not including all the other veterans events that we attend that we go to, Iris was like my go-to person. She just did it. So can I get a big old hand? We're going to go over, um, there's a little video that I'm going to show, it talks about, um, so it shows kind of the challenge of women veterans, it's only a couple minutes long, I think about four minutes long, and then we're going to go over the hard Veterans Village, then we're going to um, ask, answer any questions about that, then we're going to have the open discussion where each of you get to talk about the organizations that you represent, the resources that you currently have, and the different people that, um, you know, we could currently connect to, or you guys can connect to each other to help us with our homeless veteran issue, and then we'll have a closing. So let me flip over to the video. Um, there's a, a certain feeling that a veteran um, goes through, a certain process of feelings that veterans go through when they really are facing homelessness. And it's not simply that they are you know, homeless, but it's the process that occurs when you begin to realize you don't have the money to pay your rent. Um, you've gone through the two, three, four months of notices. Um, you've tried to go to different programs and resources to get help with uh, paying the back due rent. You really can't find the resources. And then you have to turn in the keys to the place that you were once called home and that you were about to be homeless. So I think in our, sometimes in our daily goings, we forget that that's still a process that veterans go through. We become so um, desensitized to uh, other people's pain because we see it so often, we deal with it every day. Um, if only you guys knew just within, and this is 2019, we're just now at the end of February, uh, the conversations that I've already had, I've, you know, our organization, we don't supply money for rent, but we've had to come out of pocket a few times to help people just to prevent them from becoming homeless. And there are organizations out there who, this is what they do. So why they're not helping these veterans, what we can do to get the veterans uh, more consistent and how they apply for the help so that they can be approved, that's kind of what um, you know our goal and mission is. It was just a slide that went over the history of um, women veterans. It talked about um, different from the Spanish-American War into our current war of OEF and OIF terms, how many women <laughs> veterans have served. Still, the largest influx of women veterans into the military services at one time is our World War II era of women veterans. Um, for OIF and OEF, the combined um, service of those two wars has it looking as though um, a, more, a little more than 700,000 women veterans have entered the military service during that time. Now that obviously those slides only spoke to wars that didn't include the women who joined through peace times. So now when you look at today, what are the national rates for uh, women veterans? Well there's a little over 20 million veterans, um, 20 million, just a little under 20 million, I mean 2 million women veterans nationwide. For those women veterans, the biggest states that they live in are Texas, Florida, California, Virginia, and then Georgia. And that's in order of size. So the only state that has more women veterans than um, Florida right now currently is Texas. 
So, uh, and that's a huge thing. That means we're servicing a huge portion of women veterans. So while, and once you get past that top five, the, the number of women veterans per state really dips off. So these five states really represent uh, the bulk of women veterans nationwide. Um, we are obviously, and you've heard it a thousand times, the fastest growing segment of veterans are women veterans. And then the median age for a woman veteran is only 49 years old. When you look at the average age of a, of a male veteran, it's 64. That's a huge gap. So it tells us that the average woman veteran that we're going to be servicing, she's still in what's called workable years. She's still in the prime. Um, obviously, there's a lot of younger veterans and there's a lot of the mid-age veterans, but the average age of the woman veteran today is 49 years old. And then when you look at Florida State specifically, um, right now there's a little more than 140,000 women veterans in the state of Florida. Um, the largest concentration of women veterans is right here in our northeast section of Florida with just over 20,000 women veterans represented. Our largest county, and that five county area includes Baker, Clay, Duval, Nassau, and St. John's. So our homeless uh, woman veteran program specifically designed for women veterans are virtually non-existent. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of programs that are geared towards homeless individuals or a lot of programs that are geared toward veterans, but no one has really taken an independent look at women veterans and servicing them in the way that, uh, the, in the manners that would address their uniqueness. So obviously there are similarities between male veterans and women veterans, but as, you, as I go into these slides, you'll understand why um, women veterans need to be housed in a different manner than we currently house our male veterans. So uh, these are the breakdowns for the Northeast Florida area. So when people are saying, oh, there's not that many women veterans here, they don't exist, we are here. Uh, but again, women veterans are very private. A lot of times you can talk to a woman for more than an hour and she'll never tell you that she's a veteran. She'll tell you about her family, she'll tell you about her husband, she'll tell you about her jobs, things she does in her community. And at some point in the conversation, she may mention that she's a veteran, but unlike our male veterans who lead with their veterans, you really have to pull it out of women veterans. So to go into some of our North Florida um, housing issues here. So right now there's no facility in Florida that's designed or operated exclusively for women veterans. Now uh, we know that- That's um, wrong. I'm sorry? Yeah, Sulzbacher just opened one, right? Sulzbacher opened a okay. center for homeless women and they in their homeless housing put together a couple of rooms, 12 rooms to be exact, right. for women veterans. Right, so and they, they're supposed to have a dorm over there for women veterans. Yeah, so but Sulzbacher, well. before they opened their women housing, they were in service for who? Homeless people. They're, so, they're in service for themselves. So we see designed or operated <laughs> exclusively for women veterans. Right. There isn't a facility designed or operated exclusively for women veterans in the North Florida area. Also, Clara White has a house that they have opened up and they have made that house. Um, they've designed it where it's only housing women veterans. Now, I think when they first opened it, they did try and make it um, for women. So it was women veterans as well as some women that didn't work. And now they have the housing specifically for women veterans. But again, these facilities were already in use and their, uh, their um, design and their in instruction, their build isn't specifically women veterans. It's women veterans in addition to all the other things they were already doing. More than 70% of women veterans are impacted by either military sexual trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. So when in building the facilities, this is why when we had the conversation about the new clinics that are being built in Clay County, um, St. Augustine, and Lake City, and the new one that's coming out to Jacksonville in the next you know, few years, uh, we asked, I asked specifically about there being a separate interest for women veterans. When the majority of women veterans, 70% is a huge number, you think about that. 70% of women veterans are either impacted by military sexual trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. So if having a separate interest for women veterans takes away um, any resolve or any, uh, any built up expectations she might have about walking through a door and having to encounter a lot of other people, then get, just put a separate entrance in there. It really is not, um, it's not something that takes a lot of, uh, of work to do. You can, uh, or even have a man doing a certain, a uh, few times so that when a woman veteran comes in, she can be escorted up there to the, uh, to the main gate. And I say that because some of you know, last year when we did our town hall for homeless women veterans, we have women veterans who have gone to local area homeless shelters. They've sat in the lobbies and been sexually harassed by individuals as they were waiting to be serviced. Now, if you're already dealing with military sexual trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, you shouldn't have the challenge of going into a facility that is uh, primarily to assist your services and needs, but you can't get there or don't want to get there because of what you have to go through to get to the 
the gate. And what we're trying to say is when we house, even for the people who are already in existence, think about this as you're servicing your women veterans. The reason why some of the issues and things exist is because people didn't do any research on women veterans before they opened their facilities. They just saw an opportunity to, to get extra funds by serving women veterans, so they did it. And they didn't do, not one of them held a town hall for the women veteran community, not one of them sat down with groups of women veterans to find out how we really service these people. So when you do that, that's why we have some of the challenges that we have. So these are steps that people can be putting into place to help their women veterans. Of the women who do receive health care through the Department of Veteran Affairs, so you need to know two-thirds of women veterans who qualify for health care at the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, do not access it. Yep. So two-thirds of women veterans don't go to the VA for um, health care services, even though they rate it. So either they're using their private health care or they're using their husband's health care. So that's an issue. That means two-thirds of women veterans out there who really could be getting, um, you know, the services through the VA. How do we encourage them to use it? Of the one-third that are getting, um, that are utilizing the VA and its resources for health care, the top five things that they are treated for are PTSD, major depressive disorder, migraines and cervical strains and uh, removal of uh, some, uh, I want to call them gynecological issues. But two of the top three things that women veterans are treated for deal with mental health care. So as we're establishing these facilities and as we're working with these homeless shelters, uh, the biggest impact that we can have in assisting them is to make sure that when we give them housing, we also give them the mental health care support that's there to help them prevent the situation from arising. Because homelessness typically stems out of some form of brokenness. And you can house people all day, but if you don't, ad if you don't address what has gotten them into that state, then they'll end up being homeless again. So we have to com uh, compare the two. I mean, com uh, what do you call it? Make the two together, give them housing, but also give them the access to the mental health care so that it doesn't happen again. Of the slides that the VA puts out there, there's one year where the number is lower, that's 2013, but if you go into the numbers and you read what they're saying, they didn't report, they didn't have reporting numbers for two of the age groups. So that, in fact, made it look as if it had a decrease that year when really we can't say that because two of the age groups didn't report, whereas all the other years that they were reporting, they actually had information for. So um, the issues that we have with um, homelessness are also impacting that suicide rate. So if we can begin to help women um, get stable housing, we can help decrease the rate of people who are looking at or considering um, committing suicide because not having a home is, uh, obviously one of the pressures that veterans experience that lead to them thinking about or wanting to commit suicide. So um, the reason why I started taking a look at um, using tiny homes is because I went up to uh, Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia, there's a doctor out of Savannah, Georgia that um, <coughs> sent me some slides. His name is Dr. Bonzo. And uh, a lot of the physicians across, uh, emergency room physicians across the United States have went into this program or the part of this program is called Housing First. I went up there because they have a Housing First initiative where uh, emergency room physicians across the United States have said the number one challenge that they're facing in the emergency room is the fact that homeless people are using the emergency room as their fallback for um, emergency situations, for medical, you know, medical situations. Well, if a homeless person is diabetic and they can't house their medication, where are they going to go every time they have an emergency? To the emergency room. So the emergency room um, teamed up with um, a company, uh, I can't remember the name of the group, that was um, housing homeless individuals. And what they would do is they would take segments of uh, the population that were homeless and divide them into two groups. To half of the group, they would give access to housing. They would give, um, you know, flyers, program information, who they could go to if they're homeless, how they get help. For the other half of the group that were homeless, they gave housing. Forty-five times they ran this uh, scenario all across the United States. They did it thirty-five times in the United States, and I believe ten times in Canada. Every single time they ran this this uh, this test, the group that was in a better situation and doesn't take into account when they gave them the house, they didn't take take into account whether they were addicted to drugs, whether they were addicted to alcohol. They didn't care. They said half the group were given access to housing, the other group were given housing. What they found out is the group that received the housing were much more stable vices the group who had only received the access to housing. And that's because when a person's main issue or the person, what they're dealing with um, is housing, 
well, if you if they have a place to stay, you've taken some of the pressures and stress off of them. So some of the things they were dealing with, now they'll go out into the treatment centers and start attending the groups because at the end of that, they can go home to a house and they'll be protected and they'll be safe for the night. They don't have to sleep on the street after going to or attending a group that's um, to help with their alcohol or drug abuse. And so once they um, did their uh, Housing First initiative in Savannah, Georgia, they have started a uh, uh, tiny home community for their homeless because they had a huge um, homeless uh, population up there that they were addressing. So um, the house is up there. Uh, it's called Housing First Initiative. You want the information, I will give it to you. They actually have a tiny, home, a tiny house that is on display, and that is what I did. I went up there, I toured their tiny house, took a look at it. Um, how, how much does it cost? The cost of the tiny home is a little over $20,000 per tiny home. However, there is a U.S. Department, U.S. Um, Department of the Army, um, what is it called? Department of Engineering? Is that what it's called? Corps Name? Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers. If you get the Army Corps well, of Engineers, the cost well. comes down to about $8,000 per unit. So, uh, we know that, you know, $20,000 per unit, but if we can get that grant, get access to that grant, get approved for that grant, then the cost comes down to just $8,000 a unit. So, those are, that's one of the options that we're looking at for our housing. Have you checked out Oregon? They just did it for women <clears throat> veterans? No, not Oregon, but I did look at the Kansas City. Um, Kansas City has done it a few times. Kansas City has done it, and then they ex expanded it because it was such a, a successful program. So there are a few different um, avenues that are out there. Can you tell me what the difference between access to housing and given housing? Okay, so when they were given housing, they were given either these tiny homes or they were given apartments, they were given a place to live. The other group was giving... Uh, flyers about programs where you can go to get uh, to apply for housing. They were given uh, programs on services. If you have drug issues, if you have other issues, um, basically we're telling you where you can go to get help. And then in this group, we're giving you the help. And then we're, when we when they gave them the help, they didn't ask questions, so they didn't. So a lot of times when we do things, we'll um, separate the people who can get access to it by saying, oh, if you're currently on drugs, and you know you have to be off of drugs in order to qualify for this program. They didn't do that. They just said, regardless of the situation, we're going to give you the housing. And it worked for them. And uh, obviously, that was something for us to take a look at. Uh, we do have the slides that he sent over. Uh, they have uh, more specifically, uh, because it's a, a medical slide, there's a lot of information they go into about the medical impact of housing our homeless um, and how it takes the pressure off of the emergency rooms. So this is the suicide rate, so I was speaking to that. You can kind of see the one year that, that was before, they were saying dip, that was 2013, but again, that's not real numbers because two groups didn't report. So women veterans that become homeless, what are the factors or the things that lead to their homelessness? Well, number one, um, a lot of homeless women veterans are or report as being victims of military sexual trauma. Um, a lot of times they're facing unemployment. Um, they are dealing with being either disabled or in already a low income housing situation and those times get uh, more difficult so they um, you know, become homeless. They also have untreated post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of times people, uh, when they separate from military services, they have issues instead of going into the VA or going into a mental health provider and talking about those issues, they will try and self-medicate. Um, that's where you know some of the drug use and things comes from. It's not people who are just outright trying to use drugs. They're people who are trying to mask or deal with other problems. Um, also, undiagnosed medical conditions to lead to it. Um, the majority of people, women veterans who are homeless, have screened positive for some form of anxiety disorder. So that means maybe not being able to relate or deal with large crowds or situations where there are other people. So we have to keep that um, in, in mind as we create our homeless centers for women veterans. And, uh, some deal with tobacco use, and obviously they report as having fear to poor health. These again, I, re I forgot to tell you guys as I, got, as I got started. All of my information, I only get it from either the Department of Veteran Affairs, the Department of Labor, or the American um, Fact Finder, which works through the American Census Bureau. I do not accept numbers or report numbers or talk about numbers that come from independent or private entities. So everything that I'm telling you, there is a VA uh, form that's on the VA government, government site where you can find it or you can go to the Department of Labor, run the numbers. I encourage anyone who runs an organization, you have to know your numbers, you have to look at your numbers and know your numbers. So I'm always running information, um, running our numbers for women veterans to find out where the population is going, especially because we just recently had a downgrade. Um, the state of Florida was number three for women veterans, we went up to number two, but that's because a lot of women veterans unfortunately have uh, died over the last year, and that's because our, wound, our World War II era veterans are our biggest group of people who are dying, and because they're the biggest group of women veterans, that means the numbers decrease for women veterans every year. So, 
the existing centers that are in the North Florida area. They're Schausbacher Center, they're here today. That's their, um, their mission, and that's their revenue <coughs> for 2016. And this is what they report to um, either Charity Navigator or the Department of Florida uh, Agriculture. So when you go to check a charity, these are the numbers that pull up for them. Um, Clara White is another center, and these are the, I took the ones that are primarily working or operating through the city of Jacksonville. Clara White Mission Center, that's their mission, that's what their revenue was for 2016. These are 2016 numbers because um, the numbers for um, different organizations report different fiscal years, so this was the year that everyone had the natural reporting number. This is the city rescue mission in, uh, New Life in, city rescue mission, New Life in, Trinity <coughs> rescue mission, and then a big um, housing of uh, veterans is, of course, Salvation Army. Now, Salvation Army is considered a church, so there are no real reporting numbers for Salvation Army because they are considered a church organization. Of all of these facilities that currently house veterans, what, what they all have in common is veterans aren't mentioned in their mission in their mission statement. Now, mission statements are what drive organizations, is what um, organizations lean on, is what they report to their donors. So a lot of them, for the last 10 to 15 years, have had the commissioning of housing veterans right here in the North Florida area, but they still haven't included veterans in their mission statement. And that speaks volumes about um, their focus. You know, so if you can get federal dollars to house veterans and you don't even have to mention veterans in your mission statement, then why aren't the veteran organizations who mention veterans receiving federal dollars to house veterans? Because our organizations have to get organized, we have to get in place, and we have to start our own facilities and stop relying on organizations who the commission to house veterans was never given to. Veterans, no one's going to house veterans better than veterans, period. And because we understand the veteran community. So now we take a look at um, Zahara Veterans Village. So what is our plan? We want at least 10 family units. The family, um, we're going to go into the differences between a family unit and a single unit. With those 10, we want five that are for women veterans. And then we want five that are for male veterans who are custodial parents of their children because they're a segment of the population that no one has addressed. If you're a man and you have children, you have custody of your children for whatever reason. Maybe your spouse is deceased. Maybe your spouse is uh, absent, absentee. But if you, through the court, have custody of your children, then you do the same things that women veterans do when you're facing homelessness. You get into relationships that are not good for you because you're trying to have someone there to help sub sub substitute that income. It can lead to domestic violence situations, and then you're back homeless with your children. None of our existing shelters take in male veterans with children. No one. So they, and we can't, we can't leave them out of the equation for housing homeless veterans. If we're going to house veterans, let's house all our veterans. And we want to have 10 single units for, 10 uh, single units for women veterans. Because again, our focus at Zahara Veterans Network is women veterans. That's our focus, but we don't just solely help women veterans. So this is the front of the community center. You see um, some of the pictures that are out here. So those statues that are in the front of the community center are actually going to represent a woman from each branch of service. The only service branch that doesn't have a statue, a formalized statue recognizing women is a Coast Guard. Every other service branch has a woman veteran statue that can be placed in front of the center. Now why is that important? Because that's a, um, that's a gift to the community that doesn't exist anywhere in the United States except for Arizona. Arizona is the only place where you can go to one location and see statues of all service women. Not even at the Women in Memorial Service up in Arlington, Virginia, they don't have a service statue of all services for women veterans. So it becomes an asset to the community. It becomes a reason for people who are wanting to visit the most veteran-friendly city in America to also swing by here, to see all those women vet uh, veteran statues in one place. So um, I don't know about how uh, different services name their statues, but we do know that the Marine Corps, we call our statue Molly Marine. So just, that's just a side note. <laughs> Back of the community center will actually lead to a courtyard that will separate our family housing from our single family unit area. It also allows for privacy for our families that are being housed. So uh, different people, are, the community center is going to be open to the community. But we want to make sure that when women veterans are being housed, the people that are visiting that community center don't have access to the women who are living there. So we put them behind the facility so that they are protected. Because in order to get back there, you'll, it'll be gates up and, and obviously it'll be protected. They won't be able just to walk through and get to the living area of our women veterans. 
<clears throat> so this is an overview of the back, and you can kind of see uh, what I was talking about. You can kind of see the courtyard area. Um, the family area is all view is here, but this is not where the male family units are going to be. The male family units are actually going to be on the opposite side of the community, and that's because right now the way the insurance is designed, when you house men and women in the same area, in the same area there are certain insurance um, factors that have to be in place. So we actually uh, are proposing putting our men in the opposite area of the diagonal to the area for the women and hopefully as we sit down and work with insurance companies that will meet the requirements for the distance that will need to be required between the units. Our male veterans will still have access to the community center because and we'll get into the stuff about the community youth center you'll see it's not just for women veterans it's for all veterans. Um, if you're a single woman and you are housed at Zahara Veterans Network um, it is a six to twelve month program meaning really it's a six month program within six months as a woman veteran you have training you have education you've been through the services it really you know it doesn't take a whole lot to get you into place but sometimes there are delays maybe they can't process your claim through the VA um, quick enough to help you get additional funding or housing maybe there's something the court wise that you're working on legal issues that you have so um, our goal is for them to be housed uh, stay in our program it's a minimum of six months stay now that does mean you can't come in as a woman veteran and you only need three months of housing until you either get married or do X, Y, and Z and hop out. It is a six-month program because the program is going to cover issues from um, dealing with your mental health issues. Again, remember, most of them have challenges with mental health. So going through a mental health program, going through the financial program, going through a lot of the programs that are already in existence, we're not going to do them. A lot of the programs in the community already do. So we're going to work with those programs that are in existence and say this is how you can help our women veterans. So uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, and we don't want to do anything else that other organizations that are already in this area that are doing well. It just makes sense to partner with them so that they can reach the woman veteran and so the woman veteran has the help. Um, they also have case management is a requirement. Um, the single facility, which is what's going to be the tiny homes for um, the single women, that's going to just be a bed, a table, stand up, shower, a sink, and a toilet. There's not going to be a way for them to make food or produce food within their facility. All the food will be done back at the community center. That's to make sure that they stay involved with the veteran community. Um, because women we know will um, isolate themselves. If they don't have to come out of their units, they won't. So we left something out so they actually do have to engage with um, the community center. Also, the um, laundry is going to be in the main building as well as um, there is a volunteer requirement for all single um, people. On the flip side, for families, there's a nine-month um, mandatory stay or nine-month stay because most school years are nine months long. So uh, nine months but up to 18 months depending on the situation. Um, there'll, there'll be a full unit. So we're leaning more towards trailers or a trailer style home for families because they need a larger unit. They need multiple bedrooms. They also will have a kitchenette inside of their um, <coughs> facility. And uh, right now we're saying laundry in the main building, but if we can get units with, and get someone to donate the laundry, so there's a, you know, a stand up, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Washer and dryer that stackable. can be placed in there. Yeah, stackable <laughs> system, then we'll put them in there. But right now, all laundry will be back in the thing. And participation is gonna be requested um, participation in the events is required, but volunteering will be requested. But again, when people have kids, they may not necessarily have that additional um, free time, so to speak, if you can call it free time. So the community center is going to focus on housing women veterans, um, providing some mental health counseling. So when we say that, it's not Zahar mental health counseling. We work, we attend the meetings of the, um, I forget what it's, community health um, coalition. There are tons of mental health uh, organizations already in place. What we want to do is provide um, a group of women veterans or provide a room where they can come and service women veterans at our facility so that the women veterans don't have to go to them. So putting their services inside the unit. Um, obviously the social service programs that we already work on with a lot of other organizations. We host some. We uh, obviously attend some. Also a lounge and media center area, that's for our women veteran who just wants to visit the facility. They want to come by um, the business area. And then in the future, way in the future, after the village is actually built, then we're going to start looking into creating private lots for women veterans to be able to build their own homes. And they'll live in a um, veteran area that uh, has, um, so as women veteran age, age because a lot of them are World War II, Korea War, or Vietnam War era veterans. Um, as they age, a lot of them, they want to live in a veteran community. Uh, they need help to get their grass cut. 
maintenance done, things of that nature. And there's a lot of HOAs that are out there, but if we can provide one that's for women veterans that's through our network, then great. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a focus of ours. Right now the focus is establishing the housing for our homeless veterans. All veterans will be able to use our child care facility. That is, they have a VA uh, medical doctor's appointment. They'll be able to drop their children off in advance and have to give us a, a copy of the notice or a copy of their kiosk printout. You know, always, as a veteran, you know we get those kiosk printout and confirm that they actually have a, a VA doctor's appointment and we're going to uh, cover child care. Why? Because women veterans have asked the VA for that since the 80s, it still hasn't been done. But if you have a doctor's appointment where there's a woman or a male, you don't want to take your kid to a prostate exam, nor would you want to take your kid to your well woman exam. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's have a service that veterans have been asking for for a while. Um, and then you kind of see some of the other stuff that's down there. Um, our custodial male housing, um, the invitations to the special events. Uh, it's a community center for veterans. It's not just for Zahara Veterans Network, it's for Zahara Veterans and then um, the community as we grow and branch out. So, organizations established to assist uh, the unique needs of women veterans. Um, the issues within the women veteran community are not new. So, uh, suicide is not new, homelessness is not new. We've been battling these issues for years and there really hasn't been organizations in this area to address it. There's a few, there's about, I think right now, five to seven women veteran organizations that are in the area that includes our military sororities that are in the area and everyone's, uh, you know, working their different angles and trying to assist women veterans, but it's just not enough. We need uh, people to get behind the organizations and support them. Also, none of the existing agencies vying for veteran for federal funds have held one conversation for the women veteran community before establishing their services. They just kind of pop up and they're getting money. And then they're not helping or housing veterans in a manner that will make veterans show up at their door. So, do we have any questions about the Zahara Veterans uh, Village project up to this point? So, uh, we want to go, we really want to stay in Clay County. We are not stuck on Clay County. If we did, um, you know, uh, invitations to come out look at lands that's in our five county area we would gladly go and look at it um, I'm, I'm uh, estimating about 20 to 25 acres to get, just to get started but um, at this point because housing is our biggest uh, issue I spoke to Colonel Loving here and I've gone and looked at three different properties that are right now um, either vacated um, hotels or vacated businesses where we can um, establish some right now that we need to house women veterans so while we work on the village, the village is our goal. But in the meantime, if we can uh, procure a building where we can um, turn it into housing for veterans, that's our focus. And so before the end of the year, we really want to be housing veterans and then the village can come. Because we're gonna go out there and find the grants, find the private donors, the village is going to happen. Today, we're not housing women veterans. And today, women veterans need to be housed. So this is the town hall portion. I know some of you are here from different organizations, so I really want to go around the room so that we know who all is here. Tell us your name, the organization that you're with, and tell us what you know about um, what you're doing to assist homeless veterans or programs that you that your organization offers. And I want to get started with, um, I know we said we we're going to go around the room, but I want to get started with Steve. Steve, you guys don't know Steve Stecklemeyer. He is the president of the Veterans Council of Duval County. I represent the uh... Council of Duval County, but I'm also the president of the presidents of the five counties of Baker, Clay, Nassau, Duval, and St. John's. In addition to that, <clears throat> I'm the field operations coordinator for the state of Florida for the Missing in America project, mm -hmm. where we ensure the remains of veterans or spouses and dependent children with no next of kin. I'm also chairman of the support committee for the National Cemetery here in Jacksonville. But the, the homeless women, uh, has really started to come to the forefront. And I'm sorry it's taken this long for that to do. We definitely want to assume that veteran women has part of this project that we can work on. There are places here, and you just look in Duval County or you look in Clay County. I looked in Clay, and one of them is currently owned. Um, it be a great property just to get started because it already has two one-bedroom, one-bath apartments in the back. Um, of the facility and uh, it has a little, it has a, a backyard area, a parking lot area really where we might be able just to set up um, the tiny homes. The problem right now with uh, tiny homes for most of North Florida is that the zoning does not allow them to be placed any place, anywhere. So, uh, but my understanding is, this is why we need to talk to attorneys, um, if your unit, if your facility is a brick and mortar unit, then uh, I don't know how, it says no the zoning says that there's no community that can be established of 
tiny homes, but it doesn't say that tiny homes can be added on to a brick and mortar that's already in existence. So again, it, it all comes down to having attorneys that can work uh, work the word in and get in front of the, the different councils and, and get the thing approved. And Clay County needs to be, I think it's called a pub zone. Uh, that's the only place you can put tiny homes right now in, in Clay County. And we're leaning toward Clay County because Duval already brings in a, a significant amount of federal funding for housing veterans. So we need to put it in another county where we would be able to procure some of those funds ourselves because we have no idea where the funds are going in Duval. Hey, Lisa. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Lisa Heron. I'm a Marine mom. Hoorah. 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 And uh, I have an organization called Side by Side Solutions. I'm a retired claim specialist from the Social Security Administration. So when I disabled retired, um, I decided I wanted to help veterans get Social Security disability benefits if they couldn't work. So um, that's what I do. Um, I may have a small charge for that. It's a small consulting fee. Way less than what you're going to pay a lawyer um, to do the same thing. Actually, I do more than a lawyer, way more. Um, but I do some pro bono work. I did uh, City of Jacksonville stand down last year. Um, and if I have a veteran who has a disabled child that might be eligible for SSI or a disabled adult child that might be eligible for SSI, which is the federal welfare program for folks that are disabled and um, you know, indigent, basically, um, that kind of work I will do uh, pro bono. So at least let me ask you a question. You're yes. side by side. That's not 501c3. That's coming. It's right not. Now. I'm so an LLC. Do you are you working right now with a 501c3 on veteran related issues? I'm not. I have through the VA Community Council that I know you've been at their meetings. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have several organizations that have kind of just verbally said to me, "Oh, we have folks, and if we have folks that can't afford to pay your fee, it's $150 right now, so it's really cheap, but we might." fund that for them okay. so so no i'm asking on the side of um talk to me or send me over if you have my information shoot yes. me an email or text message and let me know if you would be interested in sitting sitting on the um committee the housing committee that wants to see the veterans village come to pass yeah so let me know think about sure. it think about it you, you know we, we reach out through the social media okay. <laughs> well, my name is aj johnson <laughs> i'm with the florida department of veteran affairs my my job is to advocate on the veteran mm -hmm. behalf and getting them assistance, getting benefits from the VA. You know, we're responsible. Well, I am responsible from Nassau County, Baker, Duval, Clay, uh, Union, all the way down to Volusia, all the way over to Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. uh, and I help assist the service officers in the counties in getting benefits from veterans and stuff like that. Just to let you know, I have a lawyer on my staff. Thanks so much, so, AJ, and and. Uh, and uh, However, she's on probation, so you can't have her all the time. <laughs> but I, do, I, I just I just hired a lawyer, and she's uh, and what it is, and, and just to let you guys know what it works out. This is how it works for us: numbers. You got to document all these numbers in order to get something. And I've been doing this for 12 years, and just to show you exactly how it worked, started out three of us in Duval County. It's nine of us now. And what it is, is I start documenting those numbers and then equating those numbers. And guess what? I, oh, you bringing these numbers in. Now they want to know what, how much money you bring in. Mm -hmm. So I had to take care of, you know, finding those dollars and everything like that. Mm -hmm. The key for you guys and for every one of us in there is document your services and your input and your throughput in and out of your doors. That's how you're going to grow and that's how the, those dollars are going to come back into the community. And I'm honestly tell you this, please encourage your veterans to use the VA. That is a system is designed for us, and the only way it's going to get better is if we use it. Exactly. That's the only way that system is going to get better, we use that system. I'm uh, originally from Wisconsin. My husband's here, too, to support me today. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin. I actually started, um, started a, a nonprofit in Wisconsin called Hope for Veterans. Um, I'm transferring it uh, over to um, Florida, but um, I worked with homeless veterans uh, for about two and a half years up in Wisconsin. It is a do total different compared to Florida. You guys have nothing. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
But what I have seen, and again, we were talking about the village, and um, I've actually had the opportunity to actually help um, build the teeny homes up in uh, Racine. Bear with me, I'm very anxious today. Um, and so in the general idea and you know resources and stuff like that, but I come from a different perspective. Um, when I did, was helping out, not just in the community, and as an advocate, women advocate, big time in the Wisconsin. Um, I transferred up here and I had to take some time off for my mental health. But um, when I started, um, bear with me here guys, um, we kind of revamped the Hope for Veterans and what we noticed a lot of the situation is, especially um, these girls also has helped us. Um, we, have, we started the Sister System program in Wisconsin, which was helping um, support our women veterans to medical appointments, um, to CP exams. We have actually helped a handful already. I just helped um, with the medical. And also I am a service officer through the DAV. So I do help with the women. We have a lot of women who help with the claims and then we do some social events. So I didn't mean to interrupt anybody or you know um, push, but I also have a DAV meeting at noon. So, <laughs> so Thank I'm, you for so I appreciate yeah. that. No, I appreciate it. And um, that program that she's talking about, that's a program that really that they're really trying to get the VA to support nation statewide. So that means that yes. the woman veteran it's goes Florida. to um, a hospital with the VA and, and maybe she is feeling a little anxious. Maybe she's, you know, a lot of women that don't use the services right now don't use it because they say they've had bad experiences. But what I tell them, I post things so they know because I post things and we have a private Facebook group that we run, run called Women Veterans of Florida. Every time I post, go use this VA program, This I get a whole bunch of replies. I don't go there because of this. I don't go there because of that. And I say, hey, did you take that complaint to your ombuds person? Did you file it with your... Um, the, the uh, patient representative at the VA? No. Okay, well then your, your complaint right now is really just noise because you did not put anything behind it because if you experienced it and you didn't report it, that means the woman that's coming behind you that may have the same experience could have not had that experience had you addressed it. So let's stop saying that we don't use the VA. Let's say I didn't use the VA before because of this issue, but I'm going to get to the VA, tell them what happened, even if I pass my time frame, just so they know what happened, so that it doesn't happen to women veterans in the future. I also spoke to um, Cheryl Tillman back in January, following our discussion about the um, new clinics that are coming in December. And I've asked her to ask Dr. Screws here to host the VA town hall just for women veterans, so that instead of just everyone saying, why we don't go to the VA, why we don't use the VA, we can begin to let the VA address those issues, and then we can become advocates for the VA to get women veterans in there using the services so that they have a reason to put a separate entrance in the new clinics. They don't have a reason to put a, a separate entrance in the new clinics if we don't go to the clinics. So I, I see things from both angles, and so we have to uh, be, be a little more proactive. And so that program, we can get women veterans who don't, you know, don't feel comfortable with their program. They check in at the valet. Hey, I like a sister to sister uh, escort, and another woman will show up, veteran, to walk you through your appointments that day. Correct. How Correct. awesome is that? We've had a couple already, like especially for CP exams, yeah. um, and one actually already got appointed 70% within 30 days. Yeah. But also one more thing um, with the teeny homes, if we want to get. Um, Griffin, I was telling you before, mm -hmm. if we want to get, we can do a workshop moments first start. Okay, excellent. So. I'm not from an organization. Mm -hmm. I'm the woman veteran that you're talking about. Okay. Um, last year, mm -hmm. I have gone through absolute hell over the last year. Um, I was abandoned in Georgia. I did not did not know how to get back. I called several veteran organizations and I unfortunately did not get the help I needed. When I got back to Jacksonville, I was in a dysfunctional type of home and I ended up going into Wakaiba Hospital because I had a, a breakdown. Um, when I, at the end of my stay from Wakaiba, I, I needed to stay longer, but the VA wouldn't pay for it. So, at the end of my stay, they said, well, we're going to have somebody help you find housing as a veteran. That did not happen. So I ended up living in my car. I went to the CDC on Broad Street. I 
asked for the help there. I asked for the HUD batch program. And the lady that was there told me, she discouraged me from applying. She said <clears throat> that I did I wasn't I didn't have a substance abuse problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an alcohol uh, problem. And my even though I had a lot of mental disabilities, because when I came out of Wakaiva, I learned I have major depression disorder, anxiety disorder, PTSD, and I'm bipolar. So Based on that information, she still said they could not help me. She put in the hunt dash program anyway, and they called me, and that's what they told me. That's why I did not qualify. So they sent me to Schultz Parker. No, they didn't send me there. They sent me to a representative, and they told me that in order for me to even get into the Schultz Parker program, I had to stay on a mat in the middle of the Schultz Barker program area for three days so they could get me a room so I can get uh, some kind of TV test or something like that. Give me one second. What is your name? Rachel. Rachel, did you sign up for, or is your name on the um, sign up list? Okay, so I want to stop right there because um, what she's saying is very personal, um, but what you're saying was also addressed at our town hall last year. That is in, a lot of people don't know that that's what's happening. I think it was change of homelessness. We sent the woman veteran, that's the woman veteran that was sexually harassed sitting in the lobby of, um, she was in the lobby of change of homelessness, I think. Don't quote me on where she was at, but she was sitting in the lobby, but she uh, wasn't that not immediately given housing. She slept in her car for the next four days until they could verify that she was a veteran. And then they let her into the program. They gave her three blankets in the floor. And I was disgusted because I don't care what the process is for others, for civilians. You know, a civilian may have to go from a floor, from a floor to a cot, a cot to a bed, a bed to a room. But when a woman veteran shows up at your facility, she should be housed in the manner of a veteran. And I think that's one of the things that some of the facilities have been missing, and that's how these stories exist. But I also know, because some of these people, they do have other veteran events that are taking place today. So I definitely want to hit up with you on the end, but tell me the the ending part of your story and where you're at today, and how we can, well, you'll get with me at the end on how we can help you. Okay, well, just let me just add this part, especially about Schultz Barker, because I have been raped. I have had sexual trauma issues. Me sleeping on a mat in the floor with all kind of other men and people was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. but I'm very as sorry of, that happened. As mm -hmm. of right now, I'm still homeless. <coughs> I live in a vet in the veterans. No, it's not veterans. They couldn't put me in a veteran home because all of the beds were taken. So somebody did some research for me because I'm, I'm a researcher-holic, so I'll find things. <laughs> But somebody helped me by telling me that um, Volunteers of America was taking in new um, people. They do have beds for women veterans, but it's only a few. It may be four or five or something like that. And that's like here that. in Jacksonville? That's here in Jacksonville. And I've never heard of this. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So that's where I'm at now. And, and, and it's like kind of like this, um, 10 people to a building and you share the restrooms, you share the common areas. And so at this point, it's still, it's still a challenge for me because there's roaches and we just had a whole bunch of rats. Oh, just running around, just doing whatever they wanna do. And it's almost like it's, it's nothing they can do but put down rat traps. Well, I don't wanna see the rat. Um, I'm sorry, that's what you're going through. So you're going to um, table that's, back. That's only part of my story, yeah. but. Yeah, table with me today when okay. everyone else is gone. I will stay here a few minutes story. after. Yes. Yes. Thank, Thank you, and I'm very sorry. I, I can't speak for the organization. It's not my organization, but as a woman veteran to another woman veteran, I can say I'm very sorry that you had that experience, and that's why. But I'm glad you're a researcher because your research is going to help us make this possible. But, and let me just add this, I'm, I'm not your typical 
homeless. I know. Yeah. Most women veterans are not. There, That's there, the there is like, no typical it's so, yeah, Some either. people have an, an, a concept in their mind of what a homeless person is and yeah. you yeah. try and attach it with someone yeah. who is yeah. either a drug yeah. user yeah. or um, an alcoholic or <laughs> someone who just chooses not to work in life. When a woman veteran becomes homeless, there is something major that has required that to happen because most women veterans are resourceful. You know, we're usually very resourceful so if she's gotten to that point you can believe she it's something that happened that got her there. So I'm sorry to hear that. <coughs> Megan Warfield with Five Star Veteran Center. Thanks for coming. We're enjoying uh, hosting you here. Um, we house homeless vets. We've got 35 homeless vets here now. Uh, we, we have a mental health counselor on the site. So when somebody has an issue, we can respond quickly. Nowhere else in the city can do that. Uh, just to put it in perspective, 25 to 40 veterans come to Jacksonville, Duval County every month. And that's not my numbers, that's changing homelessness numbers. So, one of the biggest issues we have in, in this space, we have about 120 veterans right now that don't have a place to live. So, we've got challenges and they're, and they're, and they're going to continue to come as long as the weather's cold. It might slow up when it gets hot, but when it gets cold, it's hot. And the biggest challenge, as you're highlighting, is the female veterans. The second biggest challenge is the older veterans that need a place to go because they're aging out and don't have a place where they can be comfortable and taken care of. The state requires some 4,000 beds. We have uh, 720. Is that why they're trying to foster? Trying to get people to foster the older I'm ones? sure they're trying anything they can. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. We, we have had 23 female veterans in this center. Mm -hmm. We don't have any females right now. As you know, there's different challenges when you have female veterans. Right. So we have to do a lot of different things to, to house a female veteran. Mm -hmm. And I would say that every discussion you have <coughs> here about female veterans, male veterans are running into the same problem. Uh, the stigma, uh, there is no standard, you know, that you're homeless. You can't see our veterans and say, wow, these are homeless folks. They aren't. These are folks that need a hand up, yeah. not a hand out. Right. Mm -hmm. it's and I'm 100% in support of a female location where we can house female veterans. And we need more male veteran assistance, too, Absolutely. where they can have a home and hope again and not just a shelter. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thanks Thank so you. much, Dave. Yep. And that's exactly it. Veterans just need to regroup. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. To Can regroup. I just mention one thing? Mm -hmm. This center, when I went down there, they told me it was for males. Mm -hmm. They never told me it was for females until I called and spoke to one of the gentlemen that ran it. Mm -hmm. They told me then it was for females. I was already in the place that I was in at that point. Okay. but. They told me when I was at, at the <laughs> VA that the Five Star Veterans is for males. Yeah, yeah it, it is. is. Five Star is for men. They have housed women in the past, but again, because they primarily house males, when females come here, they don't want to stay. We only have so certain they, rooms yeah. that we can put yeah. females yeah. in. Yeah, and also the, um, and she, most, a lot of the yeah. women veterans, too, who are mm -hmm. homeless typically have children sometimes. And so yeah. you cannot house males and women with children in the same place. It's a violation of their insurance no, policy. So they, they're they doing everything they can with the resources that they have. This is why we need additional resources that um, function for the different specific uh, segments of the homeless veteran population. Thank you. Okay, my name is John McGinty. I'm the first vice president of Florida State Council. I represent 32 chapters in the state of Florida um, we're Vietnam veterans. We start. I started back in the, the early '80s for veterans that had problems with uh, PTSD, Agent Orange, and all the stuff that goes along with veterans. The biggest thing that you have to do is you've got the big six. You have to go to the big six and get them involved. And if they don't get involved, just like we had to do when we came back from Vietnam is you have to start your own organization. And it has to be all women, national organization of women, and come to those organizations and go after those organizations for what they want. 
11 years we fought to get a CPOC in St. John's County. The new one's going to be supposedly built within the next two years. I haven't seen any women at those meetings trying to tell them exactly what the women want in that CBOC. You they right. should be, the that we but they the should be there. That's if you exactly want to, if you want to get involved, then you have to go yep. to those meetings and get involved in those meetings. That's the only way you're going to change anything Correct. in any of these counties. Mm -hmm. Is you got to go organize. You have to organize yourself and organize your organization mm -hmm. to be at those meetings and ask for, for that time. Okay. So now, who do you say are in the big six? You've got DAV, VFW, yep. mm -hmm. American Legion, yep. you've got uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's Paralyzed Veterans, American Legion, and Vets. I think that's it. Okay. So, to what he is saying, if you guys have not seen the slide, there is a um, go to the VA.gov, hit on the facts. Uh, they are estimating that by the year 2030, there will be less than um, 2,000 World War II veterans. Right? And there is a huge dip in between 2020 and 2025. It's 2019 now. In between 2020 and 2025, they're expecting the majority of our remaining World War II veterans to die. So now what he's talking about is they have, there's also a slide out there, it goes up until 2020, 2040. And from 2025 to 2040, the next largest group of veterans that they expect to, um, to uh, what's the word, transition, the Korean, the Korean transition from veterans life that is our Korean War veterans and our Vietnam veterans. So the, the information he's given is absolute accurate. It's out there on the VA's website. There's a slide about it. Thank you so much for coming, mm -hmm. Rick. Thank you. And I will be touching back with you because we're, um, for women you. veterans, we are establishing a housing committee. And the housing committee is not women who are going to sit on our board, but it's women who have a vested interest in seeing the um, Veterans Village into coming to pass. But there are some, you know, obviously some restrictions because I have a board, and our board, you know, doesn't allow people who are sitting on other boards or running other organizations to sit on that committee. We really want a group of independent women who can focus on helping us make Zahara Veterans Village come to pass. And so we'll talk about that too. But um, John's absolutely right. Thank you so much for being here. And I, I have a couple of meetings coming up where I am coming out to speak to different groups, but mm -hmm. obviously it's a national thing. We also work um, really good. They don't have any representatives here today, but the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association of Jacksonville, Chapter 20, Tax 7, they are the first ones to really give um, towards our product project. They hosted a um, um, poker fun run, poker chip run last August for us, and they gave over $2,800. They've come back this year in January, and they submitted that $2,800 donation to their national office to try and get a match for us. So there are that's the first organization here that is really saying, hey, we want to help you house women veterans. And trust me when I tell you, it's needed. Um, last year, in totals for women veterans, our donations are, um, obviously, if you pull up ch checkatary.com, our numbers are out there. I think it was like twenty two or 23000 in donations for us last year, 100% of the donations go into our veterans, the community that reserve, because believe it or not, I work for free. Not only do I work for free, but a lot of my money goes into the organization. So um, last year, we, we, we got in total from the women veteran community, just women veterans, less than $500 in donations. All the rest of our donations came from major organizations or other organizations or private donors who gave. So the group of people that we represent gave the least into our organization, but already this year, there's been more than about $7,000 worth of requests from women veterans for help. So it's, I mean, we're fighting an uphill battle all the way, but you know, the resources and the funding is there. We are talking to a few generals now who work on, or sit on boards of organizations who have donors who do want to help veterans build homes. So those are the people that we're trying to reach with and connect with because they can reach into their pocket and make it happen. You can talk to your program. Hi everyone, my name is Sharon Lelander and most of you know me from Florida Farm Heroes. I put minors in high schools of fallen soldiers. Helena and I have been speaking, and I have had a dream for the last four years to build a tiny house veterans village in Northeast Florida. We are not just going to host a community for the males. Helena has brought to my attention that we have couples out there. We are going to look for 40 to 100 acres, and we are working our best. I actually spoke to someone at a hospital yesterday about putting a clinic on there. They are speaking to their chief medical officer to get this going. So we are working on building a tiny house village. There is a... Um, rezoning thing, but we are actually working with lobbyists and the community because I can tell you in Kansas, the, the organizations up there, they had the same problems, but they put their little tiny houses in the city. I'll be honest, I don't want the veterans in the city. 
I, I want them out in the country. We want to make it a sustainable yeah. facility <laughs> that they can come to, live on, and it's permanent housing if they want it, or transitional. We'll be having skill centers, we'll be having a lot of resources. I have organizations who are ready, ready to partner on with us. We are meeting with builders, and if we can get this going at 40 to 100 acres, we'll be putting 12 tiny homes per acre with their center resources, everything they need. I have a design, I've spoken to veterans and asked them what they're thinking and what they're wanting and we have it in this, this concept. So Helena is doing a great job for the, the women and, and, and you know as I said, our facility, as we get things, the clinic, the other things we're putting on there, they're open to the women veterans. We will set it up in a way that it is comfortable for our veterans to come in. Even talking to the hospital about putting a second location in a separate farther area just for the women veterans. We have colleges that want to come on board, businesses. I have organizations reaching out to me every day asking how can we get this going, how can we help? The, the more funds we raise, we have a lawyer working on who is a veteran who absolutely is pushing to help veterans. So we are working with all kinds of organizations to get this going. So please, help Helena, help myself. It's all about the veterans in the community. We do work with the VBA. Gary Newman, his wife, are very on board with this. And I know they actually know someone who has 40 acres that we may be able to help you with, Helena. But I go to all the veterans meetings, and I'll be honest, the veterans aren't out there fighting for themselves. You need to really get up and get up. But for the state of Florida, there's more than a million veterans in the state of Florida. I can't remember exactly what the number was. 1.8 million. 1.8 million. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. So there's more than a million veterans. We know that uh, there's more than 140,000 women veterans in the state of Florida. So I always tell people there really is no competition. There aren't enough. You couldn't build enough facilities to house the number of veterans that this state has right now. So uh, all the people who want to start their 501c3s, who need help to do that, who want to get out there, my only request is that you actually help veterans. We don't need another organization that's coming on board just to uh, procure money and then disappear. Heard there have been plenty of companies coming to Jacksonville, say they were going to do things for mm -hmm. veterans, get money from people, even having people call around and solicit on phone to get donations for this cause, and then they disappear with the funds. But for the state of Florida, there's more than a million veterans in the state of Florida. I can't remember exactly what the number was. 1.8 million. 1 .8? Yeah, that's what I thought it was. So there's more than a million veterans. We know that uh, there's more than 140,000 women veterans in the state of Florida. So I always tell people there really is no competition. There aren't enough, you couldn't build enough facilities to house the number of veterans that this state has right now. So uh, all the people who want to start their 501c3s, who need help to do that, who want to get out there, my only request is that you actually help veterans. We don't need another organization that's coming on board just to uh, procure money and then disappear. There have been plenty of companies coming to Jacksonville, say they were going to do things for veterans, get money from people, even having people call around and solicit on phone to get donations for this cause, and then they disappear with the funds. I got it for a reason. My name is Kim well, and I'm fairly a new veteran. I've been in the state of Florida for three years, so I actually retired and come to Florida. Now, these meetings are all new to me. This is the first time I'm here. I've met Elena yesterday at an all, I'm a member of an all-women group at the Vet Center. We meet up once a week, and Elena was our guest speaker yesterday, and she, uh, gave us this information and I'm here to represent that particular group. So next week when we meet up, I will put this information out to them so we can find out where we place in this situation because this is new to me, this is new information. Granted, I do hear some bits and pieces of things within the group discussion, but hearing it from the real subject matter expert where the need need to be placed is intriguing for me. I'm Lauren Garland and I represent Women's Veterans the WAC VA, Women's Army War <laughs> Veterans Association. My goodness, talking about getting nervous, I don't know why. Um, we are a national organization. We actually started in World War II with the mothers of the women who went to war. And as you alluded already, we know that the majority of women that served in World War II came out and then they started this national organization. We are chartered by Congress and we are a national service organization. We have local chapters. 
our chapter here in Jacksonville will be celebrating our 50 year, 50th year this year. We we support Five Star. We know that uh, homeless veterans, uh, one of the main things they need are socks. So every Christmas we collect socks and bring up some little goodie bags for our veterans. Um, we'll collect personal hygiene items and soaps and and that type of stuff and take to Northeast Florida women or we'll take it to the VA clinic on University Street. Um, when we go to our VA VS meetings in Lake City, we'll collect um, bags of goodies to do that. Um, USL, we've supported USL because we know they send packages overseas and we collect lip balm and suntan lotion and that type of thing. So that's basically what we do. We, we're, you know, we collect and, and support our organizations within our organization. Thank you. Um, there are several other large national women organizations, women veteran organizations who are here in Jacksonville and they just don't, they don't, they never come out to any of the council meetings, they never get involved with the community. I know because I'm a member of one, that's the Women Marines Association, it has a Jacksonville chapter. Um, every now and then they do a lunch but they really have very little involvement with the support of local veteran communities and it's also one of the challenges that so many veteran organizations are facing. I tell the national organizations where well, you're facing problems because your local organizations won't get involved with their local veteran community. So I always give a big hand and a thank you to WAX because they do get up, they get involved, and they support a lot of the veteran uh, organizations that are in the area. Thank you guys for all you do. Uh, my name is Amanda Coughlin. I'm here kind of supporting Soul Spocker, but only because I'm a veteran. And when I got my calling to advocate for homeless female veterans, the Soul Spocker was the one that I found that had or was getting ready to implement the program with the village. Um, so that's, that's where this whole thing started. Um, from my research with what's going on uh, with homeless veterans, I started my degree in social work. So working on a second degree, I am a BSW student, so I'm interning at Soulsbacher. What, what I found there through my research is one, that homeless veterans, homeless female veterans are the, female veterans are the fastest growing demographic among the homeless community. That's, that's totally unacceptable for me. We need to help each other out. Um, I retired from the Army in 2007, so it's been a while. I've been disconnected a little bit. Um, and I'm one of those women veterans who don't use the VA because I don't think I have a need to. So, you know, with, with you know, it's just one of those things for me. So I, I have my TRICARE, and that's what I use. Um, I rode with the veterans outreach team that the Soulsbacher used to have that they no longer have because funding was cut by the VA for that. One thing, or some of the things that the, the, that the veterans outreach team found is we didn't find homeless female veterans on the streets. Female veterans only got service because somebody else cared for them and wanted to help them. We would get phone calls in saying, hey, this you know, my sister's been sleeping on my couch for six months. I'm tired of her being here. She's got to go. So female veterans are resourceful. We do what we need to do to take care of ourselves, and we bounce from couch to couch. We bounce from hotel to hotel. We sleep in our cars. We sleep in our cars in back corners of a parking lot where nobody can find us because that's where we feel safe. We're not in Hemming Park. We're not in places where the homeless gather, so we don't get those resources. And the, the big thing that I've found now, and I'm working with the aftercare program at the Soulsbacher. The aftercare program follows families for 18 months once they leave a shelter environment, and we need to talk. Once they leave a shelter environment into their own home, whether it be an apartment, a house, we already know that affordable housing in Jacksonville is kind of sketchy. But once they get into their home, they work with the aftercare program to make sure that they're going to keep that stability stay in that home and not return to homelessness. So the, the aftercare program is fantastic and we do have one female veteran and her family that are in the program now, single mom with the child. Um, Northeast Florida Women Veterans was fantastic for her, but she got in through the rapid rehousing program at Soulsbacher and they were, was great for her, but transferred her to us once she got into her place. Um, aftercare provides case management we do everything to help out the, the clients. We go to court appointments. We help them file for benefits if they don't have them. We help them recertify for those benefits. We help them read through documents, make sure they understand what's being asked for. Make sure that they know how to advocate for themselves and communicate the problems that they're having. So these are all things that we can help do. Uh, and 
if they fall on hard times, we can help find other programs that help pay for rent, we can help provide food, parents who need diapers, we connect with resources. So that's, that's one of the, the best parts of this program. But what's, what I'm learning is the Sulzbacher is in business for themselves. They're a nonprofit, but the goal is money, 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 money. Always make more money, but they're not doing what they need to do with it. So that's, that's where I'm at at this point, is my mission is to advocate for homeless female veterans. So I need to know what we need, what the needs are, and that's why I'm here, and why as I continue with this degree and continue on maybe to a master's program to help with that. But there are resources out there, but nobody's getting the message out. Nobody knows how to find them. Because there are resources to help. Um, I know I've worked with Nicole a few times. Um, there are resources to help that she couldn't find, and she's fantastic at finding things. Mm -hmm. But if, if someone who does their research can't find them, right. that's a problem. So we need to figure out how to get that out there. Thank you so much, Amanda. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we're talking about. That's why we formalize our process now for women veterans. We use it. It's up here, a copy of our network referral application. It's a formalized process. Um, and what we found is that the first couple years that we're in place, we help a lot of women veterans. We help a lot of women veterans. Sometimes they don't come back and get feedback. So, um, oh, I forgot. I'm watching the clock because they do serve lunch here at 1230. So we're going to miss pay years. We're going to run through the people that are left. But the um, but the reason why we formalize that process is so that we can begin, like AJ mentioned, to track and say how many veterans are actually coming to us, how many of us are being serviced. When they contact the referrals that we give them, are they actually being helped? Are they, if they can't help them, are they sending, you know, sending them to someone else who can? How do we reach our veteran and make sure that their actual need gets met? And that's why we formalize that process. And so um, I'm sure you noticed that this year our logo has changed and a couple of uh, probably within the next month or so, our website is going to change. We've got a group, Multiverse Media, that we're already working on that. They've been working on it since the beginning of January. We're really changing up the way we connect and communicate with the veteran community so that uh, as we begin to go out there to find the money to build this village, our donors and our supporters know what we do, who we assist, and how we operate. And that's very clear because when you go to our website right now, I can't stand the website because it's too convoluted. It has too much information on it. People get lost. And when people go to the website, if they, if they need help, that's where they should be able to get to right away. So that's what we're working on. Thank you so much. So now we're going to come along the back. Teresa, did you speak with Wax? Do you want to speak on your own, too? Um, I didn't. Um, I am uh, Teresa Beats. I'm a member, first vice president of the Women's Army Corps Veterans Association as well. Um, and actually here uh, at, in my work capacity today, I'm the military affairs executive for the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp. Um, our community affairs director asked me to come and sit in um, just to see if there was a way that as um, the team and, and our efforts to get involved in the community, and especially my focus um, and my position is to make sure that we're getting involved in all the communities, veteran communities, um, active duty military, what have you. So I'm kind of just here to um, take it all in and uh, report back to see, um, you know, maybe we, we are more of a, like, let's go and do something to help uh, type, type organization, so. And maybe, maybe we can bring all the young boys and make them build. <laughs> Thank you so much, Teresa. I appreciate that. Could I just say one thing? Uh, probably a lot of women veterans don't realize that throughout the five counties, there's a thing called Veterans Court. Now, if you're into Veterans Court with a, um, um, whatever it is, if, you, if you're doing drugs or you're doing alcohol or, or your other half, has the same problem and he's doing drugs and alcohol, most of all the service, I mean, all the sheriffs uh, around the five counties, they've got to let them know if they, if they get pulled up that they are a veteran. And once they let them know he's a veteran, then either the veteran's spouse or the veteran himself can go through the, the veteran's court system, which also brings in a lot of organizations that that actually donate to the veterans court system. So that's, if the women veterans don't know that, they should know that. If their husband gets involved, if they have a, a domestic dispute, the veterans court can also help her out while her husband's going through the, uh, the veterans courts with the six month, a year, or two years, whatever they decide to put the family in. The woman veteran as well, I mean the veteran spouse is also allowed is it can draw out of that veterans court and the money that's there for them as a, as a family unit. So I don't know if a lot of veterans, women veterans don't know that. So I know most case managers don't know that. 
Huh? Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of case managers that don't know. You that. didn't know about the Metro? Center? No idea. Yeah, so that and Mac is the one that runs it out of the. Well, Mac works with it, I think, out of the Clay County office. They may know the the names of the people who work. Well, a little our bit chapter, of chapter ten eighty four is the one that that, that started it in St. John's County. Yeah, yeah that is a very important component as well. And that's the other thing I tell all women veterans. We have a lot of women veterans who, before they even move to the state of Florida, how's it going? Good. It'll be just in one second that um want to come here. They'll send me an email and say, what are some things I need. Do. I'm telling all veterans, because some of you veterans don't know, take their DD-214 with them to the DMV. Even, even if they're already here and they're going to get their um, renewal license, they're not getting the veteran emblem placed on their license. They're saying, well, I already have a veteran's ID card or I have a military ID card. You get a whole different set of, of uh, number one, prices. You pay a different price if you take your DD-214 with you. And then if you do qualify as a 100% veteran or one of those higher disability veterans, there are certain things to the DMV that you will get. And a lot of veterans here don't know that. So, uh, and that you know, goes right along with it. They should know about the Veterans Court if you're getting pulled over, X, Y, Z, especially if it's something like a DUI. Ask to be sent to the Veterans Court instead of the regular court. That's a program that's here for veterans to help them. Hopefully, though, our veterans aren't getting into that type of trouble. Mm -hmm. You want to understand that? Well, you know they are. It's really <laughs> our introductions right now. We have a few other people that are introducing themselves. Now I'll let you guys talk. I remember you from the uh, luncheon. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Uh, you were next. Thank you. Hi, you guys. I'm Elizabeth Paul Wallace. I, um, I'm like her. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a, all kinds of information. I, w I just retired from being an Air Force Junior ROTC out of Baker County, and I joined the, 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 the Veterans Council there. But I am of a service person. I want to be able to help. I have two hands. I can wash dishes, and I can make a bunch of good sandwiches. So in any capacity, and I also, you know, I was an information manager in the Air Force, executive secretary type, you know, and I'm, I go, I can help research, I can do anything. I just need to know where I be best fit. Yes. I was asking God the other day, I'm like, I'm a mission oriented. I gotta fix something, I gotta help with something. Where do I belong? Do I even belong in Florida? Do you want me to go to Texas? Do you want me to go back to the Philippines? Where do you want me? And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the feel for where I am needed and this, this right here is, Passion to me. Too. Thank you so much. I have a mission for you. I will give we can yes. <laughs> 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 and you guys do need to know that uh, while the, the state of Florida itself obviously wants veterans to the state of Florida because they bring in the dollars with them, you should know that a lot of the veterans who come here, a lot of them aren't staying because they're not finding uh, the housing that they need, they're not finding the employment that they think they should have. So uh, Florida is kind of like one of those, it's a transitional state. They'll come here, they'll stay here for a minute, if they don't find what made them come well, then they'll bounce, and this is why uh, California, Texas, and Florida are all battling. We're fighting for the same veterans, so we really need programs and things here in Florida that are going to keep them here. And then another thing, if you guys didn't read our petition on how to protect homeless women veterans, is out there on change.org. We mentioned that the state of Florida for 2017, the state of Florida brought in 79.8 trillion dollars, billion, 79.8 billion dollars in defense spending. Billion dollars in defense, that's for, you know, covering our bases, protecting our shores, all that good stuff. But there is no requirement for that money to go toward housing veterans. If we had, as a state, 1% of that money geared toward housing our homeless veterans, we wouldn't have a homeless veteran problem in the state of Florida. We have the problem because we, the veterans, have impressed on the people who were getting the money and who have the money to make it a priority. So thank you very much for that. I'm Shree Korn. I'm American Legion. Uh, I'm not a post 230, but I'm past post commander. If I tell you all my titles, it'll take me the five minutes that I'm allowed to speak. I also work for Alachua County Veteran Services Office, and we have a situation where we have no female veteran housing at all. I'm sending them up here, or I'm sending them to Ocala. So that's another reason I'm here, to gather information for my board. Because we've gotten several people that have offered to drive female veterans up to this area just to get them here. I think we're over to our, they used to call them candy stripers. When they yeah, were I'm uh, <laughs> probably embarrassed to stand up. Uh, I'm Robert White from Terra White Mission. And uh, as you alluded to earlier, in 2017, at the Boulevard House, we started that shelter or 
transitional housing for um, female veterans. Uh, we can do more and better. It's a small facility. It's only an eight bed capacity, and all those beds are controlled by the VA, uh, which is grant per diem, uh, which I believe five stars not in the grant per diem. I know what it is. Yeah, I, it. <laughs> I know what it, where it's not. But well, you know where it's not. <laughs> exactly, exactly. One of the things that I'm working on or I'd like to see is someone was saying that they bring people out from other uh, counties and currently there's no emergency shelter place for people after hours. So if someone shows up at Clara White around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, we either personally have to house them into a hotel for overnight or um, find another facility. So we're trying to develop a place where there's an emergency overnight shelter for the female veterans. So. Thank you. Well, that's a problem for all of us. Yeah, well, it's a problem for me. We've got people that we've had to we put them in a room for the night because there's no place else to go and then told by the system that we can't get them funding because they were housed here one night. That's, that's bizarre. We're going to put people out on the street and tell them to sleep in their car so they can get housing and funding to get housing. That's stupid. That's, well, that's some of the things that we need to change, and that's why we need to get between exactly get before right. our congressmen and our senators and say, hey, you may not know that this is how this program is, is operating, but this is how it's operating. Bruce Thompson, Executive Director of the Vets for Vets Northeast Florida Movement. I basically am here to help you guys get the information and put it out there. Our goals are to inform, connect, unite, and organize. There's no charge to come to our events. There's no charge to get something put in our information blast. And if you get it to us, we will put it in there. And that's what I got. Thank you so much. My name is Jimmy Hill, and I'm here 99.99% to listen. But I will tell you what makes me understand that I need to listen. I'm in a political race, and I'm not going to campaign while I'm here, but for my entire life, I went straight from high school into public safety. I went on the fire department immediately after high school. Put those boots on and put my head on a soft pillow within miles of my house every night that I worked there and never forgot that you guys were out somewhere in the world, sometimes face down in the sand, sometimes just in a foreign country away from your families, and thank you. Thank you very much. But I'm here because all my life in Jacksonville as a Jacksonville resident, I've heard how much we revere and love our veterans. And I'm sorry to tell you, I have not seen that come to fruition as a municipality. I think we failed miserably. I think it's ongoing. I think we can do a much better job as a city that claims a veteran place in the world that has virtually nothing tangible to show for it, but a handful of signs that are apparently possibly coming down lower than they should. So my reason for being here, I'm concerned, and I'm here to learn, I'm here to listen, and I'm here to pick up information. But mostly I'm here because I'm a service-oriented person, spent my entire life doing it, and I hope to get to serve. So thank you for letting me sit in on this, and I feel honored to be here, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So we, we got um, everyone that was here. We do have to get finished up, we're gonna have lunch here in a second. So I wanna finish out these slides. I'm gonna talk really just tell you how to get in contact with me, which uh, many of you already know. Again, if you do have business cards, I have um, this, become this wonderfully semi-organized person. I took a lot of your business cards, the people that I, I use and utilize all the time, and I put them in um, a binder, and they're separated now by what they do for veterans, whether it's a veteran organization, a non-profit organization, a for-profit organization, Sam, um, all that good jazz. So there's about a two-inch binder. So a lot of your cards I have, specifically for this meeting, so that I can I have to go through that. Finding your cards, leave me a copy of your card so I can um, follow up on everyone. Um, we did kind of our questions. So what can you do today to help us our Veterans Network? Number one, help us locate the veterans, <coughs> the supporters, and the resources to build a hard Veterans Village. Um, obviously, if you went through the slides, you know why it's important to house the veterans very differently when we house our male veterans, um, especially being in an area that has the highest concentration of women veterans within the state of Florida. It doesn't make sense that we don't have a facility designed specifically to house women veterans. The two, they just don't go hand in hand. We have the veterans that are here, the women veterans that are here. We know that they need to be housed in a, a unique way, so let's get them housed the way they need to be housed. 
Um, also share information on grants or federal programs that you guys have heard about, that you guys have used, that have worked for you in the past. Um, you know, I believe that what God has for us is coming to us unhindered and unchecked by any outside source. So I share all our information freely. I'm not concerned about somebody dipping into the same pot. That's just not a concern I have because this is the United States of America. There's something out there for everyone. Um, so that's not one of the challenges I face. Um, invite us to your events and to share our mission about what we do and uh, the ability. I can't say that we need to do another event. Anyone who knows Zahara Veterans Network over the last two years, we've been, uh, I've hit the ground. I hit the ground running with this organization now. I've gone back to our board and I said, listen, um, wonderful that I've worked this hard the last two years. But number one, I need an assistant. So until I have an assistant, my hours, Tuesday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is really when I concentrate on the Hard Veterans Network. Outside of that, people can always uh, reach us via the Facebook. They can send out messages. They're getting lost on Facebook because Facebook on the cell phone is different than Facebook on the computer is different than Facebook on the iPad. And so some of these messages and things that are coming through, they're getting lost in these different um, links. So um, the best way, our preferred app for 2019 is the Convos app. So if they have an iPhone, they can download combos. Why we're using that? Because it allows us some face-to-face um, connectivity and communication with people. Lisa's one of the first people to um, use the combos app with us. She toned in after we're hosting these late night gal sessions now on what on Facebook Live every couple of weeks. We're gonna go live at the nighttime, 11:30 in the evening, for about 15 minutes, and we deal or address or talk about something that's better related. After that, um, after that online portion of Facebook, we go on combos and we answer any, you know, save rounds, any additional questions. Lisa is one of the first people to do that. I know that Lori got signed up, uh, not Lori, Jill, yeah. got signed up yeah. on combos. Yeah. So um, have you got a chance to look through the videos? Yeah. Everything that we're doing, we're taking it and putting it out there so that women veterans can tag into it, they can see it, they can show it. Um, we have a YouTube channel. All of our videos over the last few years are out there on the YouTube channel, the videos from this year, especially the, the first two for uh, 2019. Uh, who is the Har Veterans Network? A lot of people don't know who we are. Go out there and watch the video, learn what we do, how we assist women, and then uh, the video that we just did uh, on the late night gal session, how to work referrals. How to work referrals isn't just how to work them here, it's how to work them for any social service agency that is uh, using people to uh, you know, push them through the referral system. Send your people there, tell them how to use their own voice, because that's what our goal is for women veterans, getting them to be accountable for the things that I say on there. What I'm not doing is I'm not creating a bunch of dependents. I'm not the agency, and we are not the agency that will spend nine hours on the phone helping you troubleshoot your program. You're veterans. Women are veterans. That means they have the skills, the resources. Sometimes they just need to know who to call. So once we told you who to call, you need help with the letter of support. You need help with us to get on the phone. Maybe you're not getting the information. You will do that. But the push has to come from the women veterans. So let's empower them with what they need to do in order to get that push. And then um, donate and volunteer to assist. I heard some people today, I wrote you down, said you wanted to volunteer, research, get involved. That's what we need. I have right now all of the uh, voter lists for Duval, Clay, and I believe NASA, Baker, the smallest county of all, can't seem to get me there. But they said they didn't, they didn't tag their voters as whether they were veteran or not. And then when I said, well, you know, the only, uh, only county in America, I know that's done that. And they came back and said, well, they put on there if they were military affiliated. That would be the same list. So they still haven't had it to me. So Baker and uh, St. John's, I'm waiting on. But uh, Clay County, I have 3,500, I mean 3,300 uh, women veterans names prepped and ready to go. We have already been approved for our UPS, um, United States Postal Service, nonprofit organization list. When I say we're about to find the money to build this facility, we're about to find the money. So we're going to need people to stuff those envelopes. We're going to need people to print out those labels. How much money do you need? So I'm estimating. Um, and me, before I've done everything, we have a, uh, where is it? It's here somewhere. So this is what we're working on. This is our business plan. Uh, I'm a business major, grad and undergrad, so I do things. Um, I'm also Marine, so pretty regimented. We have a um, business plan. We haven't put in the final numbers because what we don't have in here is we'd like to get three different land options to actually put into the plan. That's going to give us the base of what our budget is. And then for everything else that we have out there, we know that we're going to need, um, obviously, electrical, plumbing, all the different things that go into getting that facility. So until we know where the land is going to be, we can't give you a base number. But if I had to choose a number right now, say between 2 and $2.5 million, 
to get it built to what we want it built to. Now, do we need that to get started? Nope, because like I said, there are three buildings that we've taken a look at that we can just go and get a lease on that will help us get started right now housing women veterans because that's not what's taking place. We don't have a place to house veterans. The village is our dream. Housing veterans is our priority. Yeah. And that's where the big six is gonna come in. Yeah, the big six and some of these other organizations that um, Sharon has mentioned and other people have mentioned people have sent me some things I am I'm fortunate enough to have I somehow read a list of um, General I think I volunteer someplace. So I started emailing all the generals from all the different services that are on this list Their email address. So if their email is still good and valid, they're, they're about to get a copy of why I like their support with Zahara Veterans Network um, There's another um, person who is sitting on our board who works with another organization, they have a private donor. They built a little under 200, somewhere between 180 to 200 homes for veterans. And this person is a private, he's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a donor, that's what he does. He said he wanted them to build houses for veterans. They built houses for veterans, close to 200 of them. Now, can he tell them our plan about our thing to do veterans? No. He can, but it would be a good look. So there are people out there like that who just have to tap into them. So that's what, that's what we're trying to do. And then um, immediate needs, right now, obviously the emergency housing. So we have some people, I think I have some people, well one, the people, some people um, text me while we were here and said they do have some emergency situations. Um, we need a place to house our veterans and emergency. That's our biggest unmet need. Um, especially coming out of Clay County, um, it's, it's uh, you know, if you have kids and there's a place for you, but if you don't have kids, there is no place for you. It's really weird the way it's hot happening right now, but there isn't a lot of places. So we need some emergency short-term housing. That's what Claire White just said they don't have. So, um, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to send veterans to people's homes. There's also a program through the VA where if you do house veterans in your home, they'll pay you. That's a whole different topic, a whole different program. But we need emergency short-term stays. That means we need uh, people that can pay hotel stays for a couple nights or things of that nature. Get gift cards to different hotels and give us so that we can give that to the veterans so they can house themselves. Um, in emergency situations. Uh, we have to have another computer. My, my little laptop here is working its butt off, but uh, when I'm using it, then our volunteers can't use it. So we're working, I've been working off of one computer. You can imagine all I've done, I've done it with one computer. We gotta get another computer in place, gotta get a desk for those volunteers, for that volunteers that come in and out. And um, um, we're right now, I told you we're working on our website, redevelopment, that's 3,000 when they get finished with it. So it's in process, they're working on it. Um, also, uh, we're going to start the marketing campaign. That means we're going to have to hit radio, we're going to have to hit television, we're going to have to hit the Facebook. Um, you guys know we're out there using the internet, you're using Google, those uh, ads that pop up on the side, those aren't free ads, they pay for that space. Well, so we need to figure out, um, and some of the stuff we can get for free, some of it we can get pro bono, but then uh, some of that stuff we're just going to have to pay for because uh, but the best marketing we can get is still word of mouth. Share our events, share our posts, share the, um, I'm going to send you guys a copy of the um, slide demonstration. Share that with people you know will be interested in supporting um, <coughs> us and getting the better <coughs> started. That's important. George, you didn't want to speak? I have nothing to say, unusually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, though, and for recording. Uh, I know I'm going to get an excellent video because, George, that's how I met him. He was at Vets for Vets and he videoed me speaking. I didn't even know it. He sent it over to me. He's a good guy. He has a heart for veterans. Um, donation information. I tell people, stop using those um, unknown donation websites that are all over the internet. I don't know who any of those people are, and people have said they donated funds to us, they just disappeared. Um, we're very simple. We use Navy Federal for our corporate checking account for the organization. We're an approved charity through the PayPal Giving Fund. PayPal Giving Fund is entirely different than PayPal. PayPal, we have a PayPal account. We use that for business and when we're getting things from other companies, but we're a PayPal giving fund approved charitable organization. So when you give through PayPal giving fund, they track the uh, donation for you. They give you your tax deductible receipt and then they send it to us once a month. Um, also, we use Amazon Smiles. Uh, on Facebook, we try and direct you to uh, the, the PayPal giving fund, but also Facebook has something called Network for Good. I really don't quite understand it. We are approved through it, but PayPal giving fund is the best way to go. <laughs> and then um, also good old fashioned checks. You can always have people mail checks into the organization. Mm -hmm. So I said this, the Convos application. That's the business um, email address, which you all have. It's on our cards, it's on the flyers that you got. Um, our Facebook um, uh, account is obviously under our business name. Our business hours, because those is, that's primarily when you reach me. Yes, I take veterans at other times. Yes, I answer phones at other times, but that's the best time to reach me. 
Um, I mean, I'm really trying to this year limit uh, my access to outside people because, like I said, I work for free. I'm a volunteer, um, but I'm one person. And right now I have a job that's somewhere between 10 to 15 people. I'm overstressed. I'm overworked. And I'm also uh, now I'm in the process of becoming a custodial grandparent. So uh, my, my hands are tied. I'm working this. Uh, this is our priority, but I have to have our board work more. We are looking for a few additional uh, board members um, so that... Uh -oh. There you go. You're looking for a few additional board members so that they can um, begin to work a little bit more. Right now, our board members are not located in Florida. I'm the only one that's in Florida. That's been one of the challenges that we've had. So we have a couple people who have applied. They'll be interviewed hopefully over the next couple months, and we'll get them um, on, on staff here. But um, I know coming out on a Saturday morning is a stretch. Uh, thank you guys very much for being here. And hopefully, from what we spoke about and all the information we have about the homeless veteran, um, population specifically as it relates to women you understand the uh, the push for getting involved so thank you guys so much Whoa.